I was impressed to see there's a, a fairly hardcore audience here today. So uh, that's great uh, for our two hardcore guests. So I'm very pleased to say have come to the webinar dressed as though they are about to run 100 miles or perhaps have already run 100 miles. Also very pleased to see Nikki quaffing a pint of lager um, as a and she gets ready to go for this so thank you you two i'm so looking forward to this i'm a big fan of and a, and a sort of admirer of the just incredible distances that you two can rattle off it's brilliant uh, so i'm just going to launch into some questions because i know we're going to have so many so i'm going to uh, ask each of you greedily some questions for a chunk of time and then we'll throw it open to everyone so if if to the audience if i ask a question and it's rubbish Put a better question in the Q and A, uh, and and we'll we'll get onto those in the second half of the thing. So I'm going to start with Nikki. Cause Nikki's just finished a properly hefty run. Uh, Nikki, uh, evening, Nikki. How did you enjoy the Arc, which you've just finished? It's a hundred mile race in winter conditions in Cornwall. How was that? Um, partly enjoyable. The rough stuff was fairly enjoyable. But there was quite a lot that wasn't too enjoyable, but that's normal, I think. I think what I had trouble with was that once I'd done the rough stuff, there wasn't much to look forward to apart from the finish. So Damien kept saying, you know, oh, you could slow down if you wanted. And I'm like, no, I just want to get it finished now. This is it. The quicker I run or try and run because he could walk next to me while I was running, which um, the sooner I'll be finished. Okay. <clears throat> does does a do the running races you do are they ever anything other than partly enjoyable is it not just how much of the percentage is enjoyable yeah it's true they're only really partly enjoyable because i you know i push myself for a time and then i get competitive as well so yeah it's it's me that makes them up <laughs> unenjoyable yeah yes yeah uh but i presume yeah I, I presume that the unenjoyableness of them is also what makes it enjoyable it is yeah and afterwards you know finishing ninth overall which i didn't think i was anywhere i thought i was sort of maybe 20th because i did wonder at points what where i was in the race but um yeah when i finished ninth i was amazed to finish that high up the whole you know the overall field yeah right it's brilliant you did a yeah amazing um you but you um you didn't really start running that early on in your life did you your your website sex says 2001 was when you really started running so what what did you do before then to burn off all your energy in life well i was a farmer okay um okay. yeah so from two 1991 when I met my husband um I was a farmer from then well yeah until May last year sort of now um and so then I um yeah I didn't really need to run and I didn't have any spare energy to run either <laughs> yeah so it's just okay so then what uh, what changed then what got you into running well we sorted the farm out so that it was more organized and we could managed with the two of us and I had a little bit of time and we had some friends that were doing runs so I went out with my friend um and she was training for a little Leeds Abbey Dash sort of it's like a park run or it was a park run sort of like in Leeds and um yeah so I trained for that I mean it was three miles two laps it was really hard uh, she killed me <laughs> wow I think this is a really important thing for all of us the 500 odd people listening to it, to this now is that both you and Damien, neither of you started this. This is not a story of childhood prodigies and genetic super freaks from a young age. You both started relatively late in life and you both started relatively unimpressively, just like the rest of us. Oh, sorry, I'm, a bit, I'm casting aspersions on the audience, just like me, just some normal people doing normal running and then it gradually gone from there. And I think that's what's really interesting is that there's a degree of relatability to it until at some point there is no degree of relatability so you but you were fairly early on then in your running uh life when you uh got cancer and what what impact did the cancer have on on your running but also on your sort of outlook towards running 
Yeah, so I'd done the Bob Graham. So I started in 2001, worked up to the Bob Graham in 2005, did that, and then went on to the Paddy Buckley. And then just after my first attempt at the Paddy, I got the cancer. So I wasn't sort of uh, a hooked ultra runner, if you say, you see what I mean? You know, I could have, I could have stopped running, but it was actually what I really, really enjoyed. And then the Paddy was a, a total focus for me. So after I'd had the operation, I don't know how it was. It wasn't maybe five weeks. I was back in Snowdonia, wrecking again and planning my next attempt um, as soon as I thought I could, which well was the following year because um, you know I couldn't really plan anything while going through the cancer treatment, but I could still tr think about planning. I could mm -hmm. try. Um, so yeah, I think the. I don't know what it actually, I mean, it made me realise that that year I was still recovering from the cancer and the operations because when I attempted the paddy the following year, exactly a year later, my legs, although I got round in 23, 55 hours, um, my legs were quite heavy and I didn't feel right. And then when I went to try and the Charlie Ramsey, which is what the photos of, um, I felt so much lighter really different completely different person my my training had had sort of perf I'd perfected my training and it wasn't overtraining anymore I wasn't just doing a lot of miles for the sake of it um and yeah I felt really good on the on the Ramsey and actually finished in 22 and a half hours and yeah it was quite amazing to do the Ramsey do you think your do you think your experience with that illness taught you a lot about listening to your body and knowing how your body feels and has that helped you then with your running and training in general yeah i think i got to appreciate running for the for being out in the country and for running's sake so three weeks after i had the mastectomy i was doing the trunks which is a little three mile race and i felt shocking but i also felt really happy because i was still back with people and and all of my club friends knew that I'd had the cancer but everybody else didn't so I was back being a normal person again which for quite well for three weeks I hadn't felt very normal at all and I still wasn't so yeah it was that was and again in you know through my running that coming back it just felt really really hard but on the other hand it felt good to be hard and it felt also just so fantastic that I was still able to go out on the hills um, and forget about the fact that I had the cancer. Mm. Yeah, and just be a person and a runner again rather than the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, can I I'm gonna ask you a few questions now about the the um long distance running is a sport where the, the difference between men and women is far less than in other sports and uh, it matters much less than that. I think you or Jasmine Paris, these amazing women just smashing races. And do you do you enjoy that aspect of the sport that you're in, that you're in part of a, a level playing field, or does it just feel normal to you because running's the thing, running is your sport? I think this is a, an odd question that it'll be interesting to see how more, more women come into ultra running because it was only back in the 1980s we were allowed to run marathons and so <laughs> yes. you know it's not that long ago and so um people you know women are only just really coming into running and learning that they can do it and because their grandmothers wouldn't have done it and wouldn't have even thought of doing it um so yeah I see more and more talented young runners coming through now um you know like Jasmine's like one of them and I, there'll be more behind her and they're all learning from us because we the women don't we don't run the same as men I don't think there's many women that would go out hard at the beginning of a race like they did at the arc you know the three men at the beginning of the race I did ask you know some one of the supporters said oh no they were racing straight from the off whereas I don't think women do that you know we, we take it we, we're far more conservative when we set off and then we look after ourselves and then yeah, like you say, the first half of um, a race for me is always the warm up. And I was always worried in the arc about running hard before I got to mile 50. And then 
then then I'd see. I mean, maybe if I did go out like the men, maybe I could go a lot faster, but maybe I'd just crash and burn. <laughs> yeah, that's that. I, I, I just wrote down that phrase. We don't run the same as men. That's so interesting that the sort of the, the strategy and the, and the mind side of running so in your in your world as a, a running coach do you do you find that it's mainly women who come to you for coaching or men who come to you for coaching and is there a difference in in that side of things yeah no it is it's, it's women mainly um you know and I don't mind coaching men that's that's fantastic but it is uh, and I if I was looking for a coach I think I would go to a woman as well because a lot of the women that come to me have time constraints. They've got families to look after. They, they've got jobs as well. And they're trying to squash a lot into their lives. Um, and I think some, sometimes it's just confidence. A lot of it is confidence that they, they haven't got the, the gung-ho attitude that a man has got. So they do, they come to me. And a lot of the time, I'm, I'm, I, I, I just say you are fit enough. And, you know, they, they have to believe in... Well, they do often believe in me if I, if I say that um, to them. And also I, I can get them to look at aspects in the race where they can be more efficient, like checkpoints. So if they're worried about the cutoffs, they can be efficient through checkpoints and not sit down on sofas and waste loads of time. And even out on the hill, just be efficient and not stop, do everything on the go. And, and that way they're, they maximise on the time because it's always the clock's always ticking yes yeah yeah it's that that all makes complete sense to me but it it also a lot of me is that thinking that I could really benefit from if I was looking for a coach to have a woman coaching me to tell me to stop being such a macho moron and stop trying to beat that first guy out of the car park on the first lap and uh, and those sorts of things so it's, yeah, it'd be interesting to well, when I get to da Damien I'm going to ask him about coaching for in terms of his approach to men and women that's very interesting um and has, has being becoming a coach and sharing your thoughts to people you're trying to help has that helped you with your own running yeah i don't know it certainly helped during covid i was surprised during covid that i thought straight away that a lot of people wouldn't want the coaching to continue because so many you know so much of what they were running for their events were being cancelled but actually I built up a, a lot of a different relationship with the people that I coach because actually I could go well okay so you can't do this but let's work on what you're not good at um which is and, and actually quite a lot of people then found that they the training was a lot more consistent so I've forgotten what the relevance to the question was, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think that was. <clears throat> what did you actually ask me? Because I was. I'm not sure I can remember either. Oh, should, we, well, should, we yeah. just, should we just move on? Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. I think I think it's, it was it was just that the training through the through COVID. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, it was about what they teach me. So I it oh, actually yes. taught me how to how to always find something that you can improve and then Im improve it in a situation during COVID where the main focus for a lot of runners is the event that they're going to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, trying to juggle, I mean, trying to juggle running with busy life, I think must be one of the biggest frustrations for, I ma well, I imagine for, for all of us. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about, that I think so I think that's probably relevant to all of us so you said you said that um you believe in running lower mileage but quality mileage and developing a plan that fits in around work home and lifestyle I think that sounds very appealing to a lot of busy people so can you tell me a bit about your thought to do with running lower mileage and what, what you mean by quality mileage I think because I when I was farming, I didn't have the time to do the high mileage. And, I, and when I started running, I also, I did find some plans in, on the internet and, you know, and they said like do 40, 50 miles. And you're going out at eight o'clock at night to do five miles. When you're tired, you think, what is the point of this? And so I thought, right, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do my own plan, brown my life 
And in summer, because we were so busy on the farm, I just raced at a weekend and then did very little running in the week because didn't really, yeah, there was no point to doing it. Um, and then in winter, I would have a structured sort of winter because the cows are inside. And so I think that's when it developed. That I, and I race really well. And even when I'm, I think Strava is not always a good thing for people because you look at what everybody else is doing. And you think, well, oh God, I haven't done so many miles. And, you know, she's done this many miles. And it's like, well, actually, it's, what I've done is always worked for me. So, um, so when people were coming to me for coaching, I always asked them all about their work, what, what they do, what, you know, family commitments, what, when they can train. And people were like with shifts and things. Um, you can you can train and and do it around everything else and it has to be like that because when you it doesn't want to be another stress on top of everything else um it, you know it wants to be your pleasure and you want to be good at it as good as you can be and so quality miles are basically yeah speed hill hills if you're doing an event that's got hills in it and speed always um and then along, usually because people come to me for ultras, it's, you know, it's getting out for a long run. Long runs are important if you're doing ultras. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, it's important, isn't it, to try and remember the priorities of this is supposed to be fun and you're trying to fit, you're trying to enjoy it and it's trying to add to your health and happiness in life rather than just becoming a total nut of misery, not just for you, but for all your friends, family and work colleagues as well. So you mentioned in that answer about how you used, to, you used to be too busy on the farm and but you you're in a different period of your life now so that sort of changes so how how's how does running or how's the way you feel about running how's that changed in your your 50s to your 40s to your 30s yeah now I don't expect to be as fast as I was and I, I you know I've watched I've watched people go from the 50s to the 60s and somewhere along the line, the speed starts to drop. I mean, that is, is inevitable, but I, I think with the ultras, you, um, your experience is always gaining. So you're learning about yourself and you're learning how to overcome the problems that always crop up in an ultra. Like you get a blister or you're sick or you, you, get a, you're, you feel really tired or just things crop up don't they in, in ultras your head torches don't work and instead of having a stress about it you find a, a way around it um, and I think that's where we have an advantage over the sort of younger people it was really interesting when I did the ladies lake district record in 10 years after I'd already broken it because I was almost although somebody had broken it in between I was really competing against myself but 10 years older than I was then so I didn't think I was as fast as I was then but um I had to outsmart myself yeah interesting this I'm sure you there's a bit I'm sure you'll be able to know the quote much better than me it's something along the lines about ultra running isn't about going fast it's about not going slow you know the faffing around and the experience thing so that's how I guess how you beat 10 year old 10 year 10 year younger you mm. now the, fi the final question i was going to ask for you nikki before i give you a chance to go and drink some more beer briefly is i've been hearing rumors that you make a mean lemon drizzle cake can you <laughs> confirm or deny these rumors is that your speciality yeah it is yeah i think i've got a few cakes that i'm i'm quite good at this is, it doesn't sound good but it's an orange and sultana but i also drizzle that so <laughs> okay <laughs> An orange and sultana drizzle cake. Yeah. yeah, share the recipe, Nikki. It says it's. I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling the Nikki Spinks cake book coming on from Vertebrate Press. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nikki. I'm going to ask Damien some questions for a bit, and then we'll take the questions from uh, the audience. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, uh, hello, Damien. Before before I forget, I think uh, I'm going to launch straight in with the counter question to. Um, the one Nikki talked about, which is in terms of coaching, you you are now a running coach. I'm wondering whether you tend to people come to you for coaching and mostly men or women, and how their approach to you and your approach to them differs on whether you're doing men or women. There, there's about six questions in one there. So <laughs> get, 
get on with it. I'm going to have a drink of coffee. <laughs> Hi, Alistair. How are you? Hello. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for all that. And lovely to talk to you. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I've probably got at least a quarter, if not a third of my clients are female, I would think. Um, definitely, I think it feels like the gender balance is... is slowly improving like we were getting more a higher percentage of women it feels like anecdotally um i think statistically over the last few years it's, it's sometimes only 10 or 20 percent in a race but I'm, I'm hoping that's improving it does feel like that way um and yeah fully endorse the idea and i've written about this a few times that so often in this sport uh, um you know women do it better than men do um and i do wonder if it might simply be that that matter of ego where, you know, I am generalizing here a bit, I'm stereotyping a bit, but I've seen it a lot uh, and I've done it myself <laughs> um, where men have a bit more ego and, and off they shoot and they sort of maybe know this isn't quite the right pace. And I maybe have even done this uh, in races this year uh, already. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I've seen Nikki up close in races and challenges um, and, you know, not every single woman, because I'm sure some women go out too fast sometimes, but, um, you know, there does see a, t a tendency to be just to be more sensible and to look after themselves more and to think more long term and to not get too influenced by others. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I know Jasmine Paris a bit and Beth Pascal. I know I know well, and you know their mentality and races and, and how they operate. Um, it's just <laughs> it's just more sensible. They're just smarter, I think. Um, so yeah, there does seem to be a difference and. I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but UTMB, the kind of biggest race on the calendar, um, you know, the, the big stars of our sport are often from America. And there's always a debate every year that no American male has ever won UTMB. And there's always a debate about why. And, and is it the geography? Is it um, the, the, the long travel distance before the race? And actually, no, it can't be that because at least three American women have won, have won the race. So maybe it's the difference between men and women and not between Americans and, and other nationalities. Um, so, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yes, it is. Yeah. So this this the past week you were, um, weren't running. You were helping Nikki as a crew for her uh, arc. Um, how's that experience beyond the ob blindly obvious? How's the experience differ to ultramarathon between being a runner and a crew which, which is harder what sort of skills do you need to be a good crew well uh, yeah I, I, uh, in many ways crewing is is uh is more difficult um mentally because of the you know being at the right place at the right time being at numerous places having all the things ready um stressing over the tracker the tracker suddenly isn't available um um I, at one point an early car park i, I didn't tell nikki this to, didn't want to worry her but there, there were you know it was a tiny car park and all the cars got kind of stuck in there because it was a tiny little cornish road and i was worried i wasn't going to get out there in time and qu quite a few of us were so it was getting quite stressful um and then you know i um well i messed up slightly with the with the head torches i thought one head torch wasn't charged or something and, and um kind of almost sent nikki off into the night without you know proper head torch um so there's all these little things to think about. Obviously, I think if you compared our feet after the race, mine would probably be a little bit more handsome. Uh, but that's probably the only time of the year that might be the case. But yeah, there's more. In a way, the runner's job is a lot more simple. Keep going, chucking the calories in. Um, you know, try not to get too self-pitying. Um, whereas the crew people have to, yeah, wait around a lot, but but and then dash around. And it, yeah, it is quite stressful, but. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun and it was amazing to see Nikki, um, you know, yeah, have such a great performance and, and, and to study her, I suppose, and try and learn, mm. try and learn from the best. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, good way of looking at it. A really good way to learn to also to really observe how people are when they're tired and exhausted and try and take some of those lessons for yourself as well. Um, so I want to ask you about being a late bloomer to the world of endurance. Again, hopefully to give hope to some of us uh, in the audience tonight. So I'm pleased, I don't like to show off, but I'm pleased to say that your first half marathon was considerably slower than mine. <laughs> yes, that's my one bit of boasting for the entire night. Um, you've passed, bypassed me in every way since then, but you, your first marathon, we saw a picture of it, you were 36 and dressed as a toilet. And yet four years later, you were representing Great Britain. So 
what 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 uh, can us late bloomers what hope can we take from all that um i think in a way running in both a sort of physiological endurance aspect and probably a sort of lifestyle aspect tends to suit slightly older people like you get a lot of people who have become parents and they find they sort of discover or rediscover running um you know i used to play a lot of football and and running was a lot easier than football um when i became a parent because you know you can go out anytime any place you don't have to wait for some teammates or find a football pitch um so it fitted in logistically um like that but also yeah you can go on being um well being close to your best i think you know comfortably into your 40s and as nikki is showing into your 50s so that's that's really reassuring as well that's really exciting um as a footballer i'd be totally over the hill you know even 10 years ago um and and in ultra running you know i'm still in in the mix just about so that's quite exciting too um and yeah i like the phrase you know it's not your age it's your running years your running age uh, and i'm only about nine in 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 running years so i quite like i quite like that idea is there any validity to that or did you just make that nope. up to make yourself feel better just made it up to make yourself feel better okay fair enough <laughs> <laughs> so the, there's these lovely pictures here of uh, you galloping through the hills like a gazelle and it's all looking lo very lovely and innocent and we we do tend to, don't we to think of running as being such a sort of pure simple low environmentally impactful sport but I mean, is is it a fair impression that we're all this sort of heroic do-gooders of the planet or do we do us runners need shaking out of some environmental complacency as well yeah i've been thinking about this and looking into this a lot in the last couple of years when i suppose um well I I extinction rebellion kind of you know woke me up pun pun intended um um when i saw their protests and started looking more more carefully at how urgent this stuff is you know and, and it's quite shocking how urgent it is and how little governments are doing um so so yeah that made me feel quite anxious as, as a parent um i suppose and, and just maybe think what can what can i do what can i do better um and and then I've, I've started researching a book that will be out later this year um i suppose on running and sustainability um you know which parts of running could, could be improved um and yeah it could certainly be so there are certain aspects that could, could be improved i mean our, our kit and our shoes um there, there's a whole yeah i've, I've ended up writing about twenty thousand words on that so yeah uh, it's quite a boring book um give us a give us a 20 second summary then so you don't have to read <laughs> your boring book well unfortunately our clothing the production of our clothing and shoes does cause quite a lot of harm um to the planet and to other people um and and, and to biodiversity um and really, we've all got to just, you know, the companies have got to make less, they've got to make it better, but we've got to just consume less as well, take less, make it last longer, which is a bit of a boring message. It doesn't really cheer anyone up. Um, but above that, the bigger thing with running is probably probably the travel. Well, it's definitely the travel. It's, it's you know, how do you, how many races are you traveling to, how far and how, yeah, how are you getting there? Um, and we can probably, myself certainly included, um, could, can probably do a bit better there, but races can do better as well probably incentivizing public transport use or, or just traveling more sustainably. So I'm still digging into all of that and, and chatting to people about that, but that's what I'm sort of obsessing over at the moment. But, um, but yeah, probably half the people have switched off and got a bit bored. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll wind that bit up there. Well, I, I don't think they will have done. I mean, I think maybe a couple of years ago people would have done, but I really think, and I hope, and certainly I suspect amongst this audience that that isn't the case. So what are some, um, big easy wins us runners can do to make big steps forward with this without having to read your whole book <laughs> well the number one thing is the travel uh i mean it depends person to person but, but yeah you, you're showing a picture of utmb and, and I, I used to fly out there the last time i did the race i got got trains um and and that was it was only about two hours longer i think um and the footprint was um between a quarter and a third of what it would have been to fly but it was twice as expensive so you know that's not accessible to everyone and and you know governments and, and companies need to need to help us there because not everyone can do that um but yeah travel race travel is the big one you know do you need to be do you need to be flying do you need to you know and sometimes car travel if it's one person in a vehicle can be almost as bad as a flight um and i'm i'm guilty i still occasionally use a car i try and use it less and less um 
But yeah, if you can carpool, team up with friends, um, other people doing a race um, or use public transport, that, that massively reduces both your footprint and the event's footprint. And any event, the biggest part of the footprint will be those scope three emissions from, from participant travel. Um, so that's the big one. I mean, another obvious one is, is yeah, making your kit last longer, um, cutting out meat and dairy or cutting down, doesn't have to be that dramatic, um, is another one. And then outside of running, I suppose, yeah, your energy in your home, um, if you can just switch to a renewable supplier, uh, renewable energy supplier, that's an easy win. Although I must say the caveat that apparently there's a bit of an energy crisis on at the moment and it might not be the exact best moment to sw switch. I can't, uh, I, I can't, um, yeah, don't hold me accountable there. But um, yeah, no, hopefully there's something for, for people if they didn't know that. And how are companies like Innovate and Alpkit faring on all of this? Oh, he's put me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> well, I must say, uh, I'm a big fan of Alpkit's approach. They offer lots of repair options, which um, they definitely deserve being commended on because not nearly enough companies, uh, including Innovate, are doing that. Um, that sort of end of life repair or just making, you know, helping people to repair things that will then last for another year or two. Um, and that can actually be a huge, you know, um, saving it from landfill, um, you can really reduce the emissions there. Um, I mean, Innovate's thing is durability. They're trying to make kit that's going to last, um, last and last. Um, they would say, you know, the, the graphene in their grip is, is going to make the, 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 under, the outsole last longer. And I think that's, that's fair. Um, but yeah, kit that lasts is, is a really good thing. Um, there's a lot of other companies, you know, doing... Well, I don't want to get too political, but yeah, so there, there are some gimmicky greenwashy things going on. Um, you know, really, these companies need to make less. Uh, there's only one company that's said they'll do that so far, and that's Vivo, Vivo Barefoot. So kudos to them as well. But yeah, these companies need to make less, and we unfortunately need to buy less as well and take less and then look after it more. Yeah. Well, thank you for that cheerful note, Damien. <laughs> that's a bit <laughs> preachy, actually. Sorry, I, didn't, I don't like to sort of waggle my finger or sound preachy but yeah i do feel quite passionately about stuff and i can improve myself uh you know i'm, I'm a contradiction i'm a uh, yeah don't I, i'm a, i'm a hypocrite to an extent but yeah as jonathan pye said you're either a hypocrite or, or an asshole um so. yeah no good for you damon is we have reached a time where people need to stand up and shout so good on you um i'm going to turn now to some questions from uh from the audience so uh nikki and damien i'm just going <laughs> to throw them out if either of you want to chip in great otherwise maybe i'll just pick someone for each one so the first question uh, is from ed yaxley sounds like a fine figure of a man who has just signed up for a 45 mile ultra in, in august where is a good starting place for a training program for someone who runs a bit but has never run this far so any training advice for someone going launching into the first world of ultras um, Nikki, do you want to go first on that answer? Training advice. I would say, well, you're working back from the date. You've got a date. Um, 45. It depends what you're doing at the moment. Hopefully you've done at least a half marathon. And then you just want to work up to doing, I would say, 20 miles in, a, in one certain run by about May. And then maybe 35 miles by June or yeah, into July. You don't need to have done the full distance by August because it's a bit like a marathon plan. If you can do 20 miles, your, um, your enthusiasm on the day will carry you through the next, the last 10 on that race. Well, there you are, Ed. No excuses. It sounds nice and simple when Nikki puts it like that. Um, Right, a question for both of you from Helen Palmer. Uh, are either of you applying for this year's Barclay Marathons? Uh, well, I don't know how to. No one knows. No one knows. That sounds like a suspicious yes to me from Damon. <laughs> Nikki? Well, I think, well, from what I believe, the entry uh, has closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I won't be because... <laughs> And do you want to tell us a bit about your uh, previous Barclay experience? Uh, yeah, it was it was okay. The first loop was okay. was good. Um, <laughs> uh, it was fast and hot, um, but yeah, I thought we were gonna. I thought we were on for it, but coming out into the second loop and the second night, 
when the temperatures plummeted, it was just, yeah, it just wasn't happening at all. Um, and then, yeah, we got I don't know, three hours out. It's very hard because you don't, you don't have a clock, you don't have a watch, so you don't know how where you are really or how far out. Of, but I know it took us, I think it took us about three hours to walk back to the camp once we decided we weren't going to carry on. <laughs> and we got there at daybreak, so that would be about five o'clock in the morning, so... <laughs> five six yeah gosh it's a bit gosh if anyone if anyone listening to this doesn't know about the parky marathons i can highly recommend this, a film about it which is one of the most nuts and enjoyable um endurance type movies i've seen it's properly bonkers and brilliant um question from uh, sarah giri uh, uh, to both of you we'll go for you first though damien to training for these events do you do anything else except running I do, especially nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I would say approximately 90% of your training, you know, is going to be the running. That's the important thing uh, to state the obvious, but especially now I do a lot of strength training, sometimes a couple of hours a week. Um, that's partly an age thing. As you, as you get a little older, strength training is, is more important. That's been proven in studies, and, but also it helps your running economy. Another study has shown that, um, but also it should make you, you know, you more injury resistant, um, and, and hopefully your legs and other muscles, you know, more fatigue resistant. So there's loads of reasons to do good strength training. Um, what else do we do? I mean, I see it as a total holistic thing. I mean, your sleep is part of it. What you eat is part of it. Your mindset, how stressed or relaxed you are leading up to the race or, or around your training is part of it. Like to me, everything is, is uh, involved. Um, so I, I almost see it as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm permanently training, <laughs> I suppose. Um, yeah. That's an interesting point. Nick, is there anything you want to add to that? Do you, what do you do training except for running? No, mine's all running, really. Um, apart from what I do in my daily life, I think. I have, I was very good at plyometrics during lockdown, bouncing around my kitchen, but uh, since lockdown's ended and I can get out of my kitchen, I'm not very good at my plyometrics, but they actually, they do really work hopping, jumping, things like that. Um, yeah, big believer of it. It's just finding the time to do that as well as everything else. Thank you. <laughs> Nick, we've got a question for you here from Johnny Parsons, who I suspect just wants to make him feel bad about himself. But he says, I did my Bob Gray round in 2009 and I was absolutely goosed on the verge of passing out at the end, but loved every minute. My question is, how did you feel when you turned around at the halfway point on your double Bob Graham round? Well, the sort of way I did it when I went halfway round and turned round and came back, when I actually turned round, I'd done more than half of it. I had 16 hours to go in effect. Um, doesn't really make much sense until you actually sort of look at the map, but yeah. I think it wasn't really the the time that I had left. To, it was the fact that I'd just gone through the second night without any sleep that was really wiping me out. So yeah, I started at midnight on Friday and by seven o'clock Sunday morning, the, the, the brain had really gone on strike and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And um, I needed a power nap and so I had 10 minutes and that just sorted me out straight away. And then the next 16 hours just look completely doable and off I went. Everything's relative. Wow. OK. Uh, uh, there you are, Johnny. I hope that made you feel better. Ready for your own double Bob Graham attempt now. Um, question for um, well, either of you from Andy Bassett. What are your views on the spiralling costs of entering races? Is this making ultra running a sport only for the wealthier members of society? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and also, I think, you know, quite a lot of these races, they, they you know, the mandatory kit list, um, you know, there can be quite a lot of items on that that aren't cheap. When I was first getting into it, yeah, it was quite, it was relatively prohibitive, actually. Um, so that is a shame. I don't know what the solution is. I mean, you want, you want the events to endure. You want them to be there the next year. I don't know enough about these events to know whether, you know, they could charge less or not. Um, but you would hope... That, that it's an accessible sport. Um, I don't know what the solution is there, but I think that's something 
you know, we should keep talking about actually. And, and I mean, black trail runners, for example, have done great work recently trying to, you know, make the sport more accessible, more diverse. And, you know, I think they've done great work and I think they've been quite, you know, they've contacted races directly and said, how are you going to, you know, have a more diverse uh, sort of starting list uh, for your race? How are you going to do it? Which I think is a brilliant approach. Um, but yeah, that's something I hadn't thought loads about recently. So I, I think, yeah, we should all keep talking about that actually. You, you want it to be accessible, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I yeah, agree. Um, question from Ruth Moore. Uh, Ruth is new to this uh, world. She's doing her first half, her first trail half in April, which is quite a hilly one, but she can't get to the hills very often. Do you have any tips for training for trails and hills when you live in a city? Well, I think it would be, um, yeah, plyometrics jumping, hopping, strength training, and maybe a gym where you've got one of those steppers or something um, to get some sort of ascent in. Otherwise, I do think that fast flat runners always seem to come past me on the hills. They seem to be able to manage it. If you can run fast and flat for a long time and then slow down and appreciate the fact that you're running up the hill and you're not on the flat, then I do think your legs somehow let you do it. Oh, every now and again when the, when the when it's not massive mounts of ascent in your trail marathon a friend of mine trained for mount everest by running up and down the a the steps of a multi-story car park a lot of times oh. I w if you if i can jump in there i would i would e echo what nikki says there about speed like don't neglect that do that first you know get faster improve your running economy um and that is going to help a lot. Uh, and I think there could be a temptation if you've got a big hill outside your house to just go up and down that hill a lot. And actually that might over time slow you down, actually, uh, if you do that too much. Like, yeah, do work on developing speed. Definitely. I think that's really under sort of underestimated in ultra running. Um, and, and just I did spot if I can backtrack a tiny bit. I did spot a comment in the chat just there. Someone pointing out some cheap ultras. Um, I think that's a fair point. There are there are quite a few accessible ones. And also the, what's great is challenges, I suppose, like the Bob Graham, where, you know, there isn't an entry fee. Um, so there is that sort of stuff going on. But yeah, the top end races can be very, very expensive. Yeah, and there are still all the fantastic fell races where you register in the back of a sheep trailer um, just outside the pub, aren't there? Um, lots of questions about toughening your feet beforehand and managing your feet during races. Any uh, pro tips on that from either of you well I when I was in wellies a lot and then I did an ultra and about six weeks later after the 100 mile all my skin the skin came off my feet and my feet had really hurt during the race and I asked the doctor what this might be and he actually said it's the hard skin that you've developed from wearing wellies all day especially because it was always around my heels um, and the sides of my feet he said it's just the friction all those hours of your hard skin and the soft skin going like this and basically the hard skin comes away and then the hard skin dies so I actually soften my feet for um, a bit like they do for the marathon de sables um, it's well known that they soften their feet so the sand doesn't get in the cracks and create you know blisters and things so that's what I do for about well, I don't know three months before I'm doing a a long race like the Tour de Géants where I know I'm going to be on my feet for like three or four days, five days. Just use that heel softener crack repair stuff and put it on and then put some socks on and when you go to bed at night. Damien? Yeah, I seem, I seem to be fairly lucky in that department. Um, I would say it might be stating the obvious, but, you know, yeah, find, find the sock and shoe combination that works for you and, and ignore everyone else because feet are, are really quite different, actually. Um, mine have got some weird lumps in some weird places and, and most people's feet seem to be pretty unique. So just because someone else is wearing this shoe and that sock um, doesn't mean it works for you. So, yeah, find out, find out what works for you and, and, um, and stick with it, really. Um, yeah, that seems to have worked for me, really. Thank you. Thank you. So a question from Joe Tippett, who says this may be a really silly question. Well, let's find out, Joe. Um, has changing to a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle benefited your running and energy levels? And that leads on also to a question from Virginie, who says, what do you have for breakfast during your events? 
<laughs> Sorry, I was falling asleep there because my energy levels of. Have... Um, yeah, I switched. I, I went full vegan. I don't know. I've, I've lost count. Maybe over a year ago after experimenting for a while. Um, yeah, I haven't really noticed any difference either way. Uh, uh, what can happen is, is, you know, a meal that you think is going to fill you up doesn't necessarily fill you up because often there are less calories in it and you find yourself snacking more, but I'm, I'm all for snacking. That's fine. Um, so yeah, I haven't really noticed any difference. Um, I've definitely got friends who've said it's transformative for them, uh, run, runner friends, but it hasn't been for me really, but I feel a bit better about my place in the world, but breakfast during an event, or pre, pre race breakfast. It says during an event. During an event. Oh, it could be anything. It could be a curry sandwich. Okay. It could be, yeah, it could just be. Just shoveling stuff in. Oh, yeah, it could be all sorts. Blimey. Okay. Yeah, curry sandwich. When I ran the pen away, I definitely had a nice curry sandwich for breakfast. That was good. Okay. Uh, Nikki, what about you? What are your thoughts on uh, your diet and running and energy levels? Well, I think before I do a race, yeah, it's porridge and stuff. And then during the race, it's whatever will go down and I actually fancy on the race which changes as like on the arc I, I said I was going to eat rice puddings and I think I did and then I also think yeah I ate expedition food meals as well because they're just very high calorific and they're quite tasty as well and you can swap. Damien did a great job of producing a different one when I'd started to go off the last one um, yeah so that was actually yeah, the, the granola at the end was, was quite a game changer, really. <laughs> I think after the, what had I had? I think I'd had macaroni, cheese, then oh, yeah. porridge. I remember having the porridge and going, that's disgusting. And then as it hit my stomach, it actually really settled my stomach and I reached for it again. <laughs> Do you remember me doing that? Yes, yes. <laughs> you looked at me as if to say, well, you've just said it was disgusting and you're going for more of it. <laughs> <laughs> you contrary woman. <laughs> so we've got a question here from uh, Brijesh who says, uh, how do you get your body to move when it doesn't want to move? Damon, here you go first on that one. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, Mind but, over matter, isn't it? Uh, it's got to be really, hasn't it? It's, it's, it's the classic sort of being motivated by the challenge and remembering your why. And if you're still motivated mentally, then... You know, I've never got to a place where physically you couldn't go forward. Um, often it, the problem is if your mind switches off or doesn't seem to want it anymore, that's usually the, the bigger problem. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think mind over matter, really. Yeah. Which sounds very trite. So how when you're absolutely knackered and it's lashing with rain and you're not going to win and you've run out of custard, how do you actually get yourself to get to go? Do you, have, do you have mantras? Do you write things down beforehand? Because what, what, what you declare before a race you're definitely going to do is quite different in the cold middle of the night, isn't it? I think it's knowing yourself because like Damien said to me on the Paddy Buckley when I was wanting to give up, he said, you'll only come back and do it again, <laughs> which is true. And I've yes. already done, I can't remember, I'd already done most of it. I've got four legs to go, but to come back to get to the same point, I'd have well a whole round and then a whole leg to do so I mean things like the obvious that is pretty and I knew he was going to say that because I knew I would already worked it all through in my head what I would tell myself in this situation but I think I just wanted some confirmation and um and also I just say to myself well do you want to finish this or or not and if the answer is yes I want to finish it it's like well what what are you going to do to make to make yourself finish it and at that point I knew I had to eat something because I'd run out of energy because I'd been quite sick so we started on forcing noodles down we didn't we met Damien or yeah to get the energy back in I mean I think if you're actually walking and you know you should be running you just need to if you pick a little point in the distance 20 meters away when you get there just say go to yourself and we're programmed to go when somebody says go and we go. I learned that because I used to be a skydiver and to learn that you get to the edge of the plane and the instructor shouts go. And in training, they've been doing this and you go. And when they say go, you jump out of a plane. 
even though all of your instincts are going, don't jump out of the plane. <laughs> my my brother's a, a tandem skydive instructor, yeah. so but they would only get paid if the customers actually jumped out of the plane. So they used to say that, no, 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 sounds very much like go, <laughs> go, go, and they just jump out of the plane anyway. <laughs> Um, right, question from Alex Banks, who says that Nikki Run Forever is my favourite running film. And this is probably a good thing for other people just to put in the chat, is, that, is this question. Do you have any running films that you like to watch, if you have any time? Any recommendations for good running films? I don't tend uh, to watch a lot of running films, but I'll go on to Matt and Ellie's, um, what's their website, Damien? So it'd be Summit Fever Media. Yeah, probably. Their, their films are good because they're um, obviously they're they're runners and they get up on the hill and they tell the sort of proper story. It's not just all the glitz. Um, yeah, they work incredibly hard. Yeah, to, to yeah, they hardly sleep. So they and they know. Yeah, they kind of know us well enough to know when we're going to be at our worst. So when you're yeah puking in a bush or sort of drowning in a puddle of your own urine there they are hello look. <laughs> hello i'm just recording you yeah. um so yeah no they're very they're very astute filmmakers very talented but they've got a lot of good films um yes um unfortunately i'm in some but so is nikki so they are worth watching those ones um yeah i, I do like um uh, what's that classic one from western states unbreakable i think it is that i quite enjoy that um and there is yeah there's the classic barclay marathons one isn't it that when the race that eats it's young or something that's quite good. Um, yeah, there's a few to keep people busy. It's, very, it's a very short one, but I love it. And I can't remember the title. Um, of Fells and Hills. Of Fells and Hills. It's only about seven minutes. It's a Salomon film on, um, on YouTube about why go running in the hills. It's a uh, shot in the Lake District. I absolutely love that. It's really, really good. Um, question for Damien from, uh, from Simon Tibbet. How hard was it? to decide to pull out of this year's spine race whilst leading? Well, it didn't really feel like a decision, if I'm honest. It, it just seemed impossible. So I had a, a, groin, a groin issue that um, got worse and it, I couldn't get over styles. I had to sort of literally lift my leg up to, to sort of lift over style. And I still had nearly 50 miles to go, which on that terrain is, is around 24 hours. And to me, it just didn't seem possible that I could go on you know more than a few miles so it didn't really seem like a decision um it seemed, it felt like a physical thing and then yeah the, the medics weren't sure maybe whether I had a hernia or, or not so you know it was reasonably serious so yeah it's much better so I've had two DNFs I see I consider one one to be a physical one and then I had a sort of mental DNF at UTMB last year and that's far more troubling where you're like physically I was fine or, or, you know, as fine as you are after 50 miles in the mountains. Um, but, you know, mentally, I sort of had a mental injury or, or something failed mentally. And that's more troubling for me than, you know, if you have a physical issue and you just can't go on, then no, I was fine with it. I had a, I had a brilliant time um, on the race and very keen to go back next year. And following on from that, Robert wonders whether your injury may have come because you kept going so fast, even once Kim had dropped out. <laughs> Is there anything no, in that? I mean, I guess hindsight's a wonderful thing and, and we'll never really know. Um, it doesn't, it didn't feel that fast. Like I've, I've looked back at my Strava thing and often they were like 20 minute miles and stuff because that, that terrain is, is quite challenging sometimes. Um, it didn't feel especially fast. But yeah, if I, had, if I could have that race again, I probably would go 10% slower overall just to see if that would, you know, uh, protect my delicate groin region. Okay, but it's always a good thing to do. So we're, we're coming to running out of time here. A uh, good question here from uh, Robert Jamieson, which is an excellent question itself, but also a good chance for Damon to plug his book, which is, can either of you recommend any good running books? And I always like to ask this question because I like good books to read. No, mine's rubbish. Don't buy mine. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh I've got a whole bookcase behind me, actually. You go first, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki, any good um, running books? Yeah, I don't tend to, to sort of read a lot of running books. I mean, I do read them. Um, 
I do, I do like Steve. Have you read Steve Birkinshaw's, Nikki? That's a good one. There is no map in hell. You must have read yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Your book is good. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. Um, I'm just looking. I mean, I've read all the, I mean, yeah, the classic um, Feet in the Clouds. I mean, that is, that is wonderful, wonderfully written. Uh, I, I do like, obviously, a Darren Ann Finn's newer one, The Rise of the Ultra Runners. That's a good, really good insight into ultra running, as you might hope. Um, there are loads of good ones nowadays. Uh, um, okay. Well, I think everyone should read your book, Damien. It's got a grudging endorsement from the great Nikki Spinks. So you can put that on your cover now. Your book is good, and you don't have to have a tone of voice in there. You just, she said it, your book is good. So great. Um, we've got so many questions. I really apologise to all those people who didn't get their uh, questions asked. Um, thank you. For, there's so many. I really, there's, I apologise, yeah, for not doing more. Uh, but here's one that I must end with. I've just spotted it from Julie Burns. Has Damien forgiven Nikki for stealing the macaroons? No. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> I didn't steal them, I borrowed them. Well. One, two, mm -hmm. actually. Really? And you wouldn't have known if I hadn't have fessed up. I did know, because I was staring at them, I was a bit tired, and I was like, I don't think I had any macaroons, but there are some missing. And you'll notice everyone that her story changed a bit there, from one to two. So, who are you No, I offered with? James one. Oh so dear. You are, you, not only did you steal some yourself, you were offering them around. Well, I'm afraid I've seemed to have opened an entire can of worms slash box of macaroons. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> Damien and Nikki. It's been really great talking to you. And I'm going to hand back now to Rob in the studio. Perfect. Thank you so much, Al, uh, for hosting that. And thank you so much, uh, Nikki and Damien as well, for, for being part of part of this today. It's been it's been amazing, hasn't it? Absolutely fantastic to hear from you and brilliant questions from everyone as well. So there's just a, a few things I want to say um, alongside those thank yous is, um, so firstly, if you want to carry on hearing from Nikki, Nikki has uh, given such a ringing endorsement to her own Instagram account. It's almost like she's borrowed tips from Damien on, on marketing. Uh, she said, oh, my Instagram is all right. It's very random, which I think we'd all agree are the best types of Instagram accounts. So do follow Nikki Spinks on Instagram, find out what she's up to, um, follow, follow what she's doing. And then in terms of Damien, you, he's on Instagram as well. Um, Ultra Damo, uh, as, 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 he's, as he's called. But I will say... If you are at all interested in this rubbish book that Damien's written, um, it's called In It For The Long Run, and you can get it from our very, very, very good friends at Vertebrate Publishing. So head over there, you can, you can, you can get that book. If you can't be bothered to read that one, there is another one that, um, that Damien's got coming out later in the year, and it's about um, sustainability and running. And after, you, after you've heard Damien talking, and if you have happened to have read In It For The Long Run, it won't be as boring as Damien reckons it, <laughs> reckons it will. Um, so do, do follow up on those. Um, and then finally, thank you to everyone. Thanks for being involved tonight. Thank you for taking time to spend with us. Thank you for all your tips on books, tips on films, favourite cakes, favourite runs. Um, it's been fantastic. What I'm actually going to do is publish those alongside the YouTube video. So if anyone's missed any of the recommendations, you'll be able to see it tomorrow. I'll email, I'll email it all out. And then finally, final thing, if anyone's thinking, oh, it's, it's 8.34, I'm a bit tired for a run now, I don't think I can make it out. I think we just need to think of Nikki's advice. Feel a bit tired, 10 minutes sleep, that'll sort you out. You can go running till 8 o'clock in the morning then. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it, all your time. Al, Nikki, Damien, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's been with us. We'll see you all soon.